Yo, what's good, YouTube? Welcome back to Skylar Reacts. Today, we got how a road test idea became the deadliest race on earth. All right, I hope you guys enjoy. As always, please leave a like, comment, subscribe, join the fam, and yeah, let's get it. Think of the Isle of Man TT, and I've no doubt your mind will conjure the image of road riding warriors racing Damn. at unbelievable speeds in the most dangerous of environments, riding at over 200 miles an hour, inches away from stone walls, hedges, and sometimes spectators. Even after many years watching myself, to this day, I still cannot get my head around what these modern day gladiators are able to do on a motorcycle in this environment. Which is insane, by the way. Insane. But did you know that what you see today wasn't exactly what the founders of this historic event set out to create? In this video, we're going to look over the history of speed at the Isle of Man TT and show how a simple idea shared by a magazine editor around a dinner table went on to become the most dangerous motor race on the planet. From the humble Damn. beginnings well over a hundred years ago, through decades of advancement in motorcycle technology and rider skill that raised the limits of what was possible on this iconic circuit. Along with some key moments and legendary riders who pushed the records to eventually reach the mind-bending numbers we see in modern day TT races. But to understand just how far we've come, we need to go back to the beginning. Back to when the very idea of a motorcycle race on the Isle of Man was something else entirely. All the way back to 1907. Damn, that's well over a hundred years ago, bro. That's insane. That is, bro. They had motorcycles back then. God damn. Okay. Now, racing had already been happening on the Isle of Man for a couple of years by this point, albeit with a few more wheels. In 1904, in response to the UK government banning racing on public roads, the organisers turned to the Manx government, who have control over their own affairs being outside of the UK, and proposed the idea of bringing motor racing to the island as a way to continue pushing the motoring industry forward while bringing more people to the island in the process. Mm. The Manx authorities agreed, and in 1905 the first races on the Isle of Man were held, taking place on the 52 mile Highlands course around the island. It wasn't until two years later in 1906 that the idea of bringing motorcycles to the island was born. Frustrated by the restrictive nature of the Europeans' approach to motorcycles. Bro, look at a motorcycle. I know after like a few like miles, I know your back gotta be hurting. I know that is not comfortable whatsoever. And you're not even going that fast as well too. Sport, which stifled advancement in motorcycle design from a practical perspective, the British motorcycle industry wanted a way to showcase the bikes they built for your everyday rider. Coupled with some shady practices seen on the continent which brought its sporting integrity into question, they decided they wanted to create a real road race for real motorcycles. There would be no weight limits, bikes would have to be fully equipped with saddles, pedals, mudguards, silencers, and even a toolkit had to be included for running silences. repairs to remain true to their touring capabilities. There would be two classes, one for single cylinder engines and one for twins, with fuel economy limits set at 90 and 75 miles per gallon respectively. This was to be a test of real- Bro, imagine getting 90, 90 miles per gallon. Oh my God, bro. I will be going to the gas station at least like twice a year. <laughs> real motorcycles that advanced the British motorcycle industry while allowing them to show what these bikes could do. The plans were made public by the editor of the Motorcycle Magazine at the annual dinner of the Auto Cycle Club in January 1907. The plans were approved by the Isle of Man authorities and they were, quite literally, off to the races. The winner of this touring motorcycle event would be given a trophy, and thus the Tourist Trophy Races were born, or as it's known today, the Isle of Man TT. The first race took place on the 28th of May 1907 on the shorter 15 mile St John's course because the bikes of the time couldn't make it up the mountain section of the main course. The first race was won by Charles Collier riding a matchless machine in 4 hours and 8 minutes recording an average Four speed hours? of 38.21 miles per hour. It wasn't until 1911 that the motorcycle race moved to the established 37 mile mountain course which is much the same course that's used today. As well as the course change, the bikes themselves were beginning to change too. The two separate categories were scrapped, fuel economy targets were dropped, and the pedals could no longer be used. That oh. year, the most prestigious race, the Senior TT, was won by Oliver Godfrey, setting an average speed of 47 points. So you mean to tell me over 100 years ago, we basically had like electric bikes or gas powered bikes? Interesting. Six, three miles an hour, already showing significant improvement even on the more challenging mountain course. In these early years, the course was little more than a horse and cart track, but as the event rolled into the oh. 20s, the road conditions began to improve and the pace was starting to pick up. 
the 1929 senior TT, Charlie Dodson won the race on his Sunbeam in the 500cc class. The bike only had about 16 horsepower, but with an improved chassis, 16? tires, road surface, a reported top speed of 90 miles an hour, and improved rider skill, Charlie recorded an average speed of 72.05 miles an hour on his way to winning the race. And as the speeds crept up, so did the risks. There had been eight deaths in those first 18 years on the mountain course, but four of them no. had come in the last two years, showing that the dangers were getting more and more severe. By this point, helmets had been- Yeah, as, as motorcycles get faster and faster, yeah, the debt rate's gonna go up. It's gonna get increased. Yeah. Come mandatory. But aside from that, and a few tweaks to the safety features of the course, it was already becoming a dangerous test of nerves and skill. Moving ahead Ooh. to 1938, and the lap record was edging ever closer to 100 miles an hour. That year, Harold Daniel completed a lap of exactly 91 miles an hour on his Norton in the Senior TT. As advancements in motorcycle technology continued, it seemed like the 100 mile an hour lap was only just around the corner. But as we'll learn later, it would actually be some time before that would happen. After I don't think now bikes is going like 200 miles an hour, like 250 easily is mind blowing like how fast we progress as like a spe like as a species is insane after an eight year absence due to the breakout of world war ii the 1947 tt was the first since 1939. daniel got straight back to winning ways and won the senior tt race with an average speed of 82.81 miles an hour the slower speeds largely due to the poorer fuel quality that was available post-war as well as the banning mm. of superchargers which was becoming popular in the 1930s but two years later, something significant happened, something that would take the dedication of speed on the island to greater and greater heights. What? 1949 saw the birth of the Grand Prix World Championship, known today as MotoGP, and the Isle of Man TT would be the first race in that inaugural season. It was the following year in 1950 that the 91 mile an hour record that was set 12 years earlier would finally be beaten. Jeff Duke riding a Norton clocked a speed of 92.37 miles an hour to take the win at the Senior TT. Damn. And it was through the 50s and early 60s that some real racing icons would arrive. World Championship status brought the world's top riders to the TT. Along with Jeff Duke, names like John Surtees, Mike Howard, Jim Redman, Phil Reed, and the legendary Giacomo Agostini. The 50s Agostini. also marked the arrival of some fresh blood in the way of manufacturers. Where the TT had been dominated by British motorcycles, the emergence of the Italian manufacturers Mondial, Gelera, and MV Augusta brought heightened competition and a push for greater speeds. And it was in 1957 that the 100 mile an hour lap record was finally broken. On his second flying lap, Scotsman Bob McIntyre set an average speed of 101.03 miles an hour, right setting over. that new lap record. Bob rode a Gelera to victory, and this 500cc racer pumped out 70 brake horsepower and was capable of 160 miles an hour. What it started off, what, 16 horsepower to 7? That's a big jump. That's a big jump. Now, what riders do today is incredible, but can you imagine doing those kind of speeds down the Solby Strait with the machines, tires, and road conditions they were dealing with back then? Absolutely incredible. But these speeds came at a price. By 1957, the total number of deaths was up to 36. Damn. And if we include the amateur Manx Grand Prix events held on the island, it took it to 55. But things had no signs of slowing down. In fact, we were about to head into a golden era for TT racing. 1959 brought the first of the Japanese manufacturers, Honda, Honda with Kawasaki, Suzuki, and Yamaha to follow in later years. Once again, this brought increased competition with each manufacturer pushing the limits to stay ahead. Through the rest of the 50s and 60s, the likes of John Surtees, Mike Howard, and Giacomo Agostini, among others, were locked in many titanic battles across the different classes. Surtees amassed six wins, Agostini bagged 10, while in 1961, Howard won his first of 14 Damn, TT 14? victories. The senior race in 1967 saw a battle between Agostini and Howard that is still regarded as one of the greatest ever races on the island with the latter taking the honours while clocking a 108 mile an hour lap record in the process, another record that would stand for some years. But as we move into the 70s, sentiment for the event was starting to change for some. By 1972, the death count stood at 100 riders between the- Bro, the fact that this sport is still legal and still happening and knowing these death tolls just keep rising as the years go by, it's mind blowing. <laughs> TT in the Max Grand Prix. And even though Agostini had won the first three races of the decade, it wasn't enough for him. 
When his close friend Gilberto Palotti was killed during the TT that year, Agostini announced no. that he would never race on the island again, declaring it was too dangerous for an international competition and outrageous that riders were being forced to ride it. It did remain as a Grand Prix World Championship event until 1976, with the most notable event happening in 1975 when Mick Grant beat Mike Howard's eight-year lap record with 109.82 miles an hour aboard a two-stroke triple Kawasaki. But with more and more riders following Agostini and boycotting the event, 1976 would be the last time the Isle of Man would host a round of the championship. The British mm. Grand Prix was then handed to Silverstone. The following year, a new Formula TT racing class was created to be run under the umbrella of the International Motorcycling Federation, allowing high-level road racing to continue on the Isle of Man, keeping a now 70-year-old event going. And many fans will be thankful they did, because it was at this time that we saw the emergence of one of the most famous names, not just in motorcycle Ooh. racing, but in all of motorsport, Joey Dunlop. As a relatively unknown rider in just his second year racing on the island, in 1977, Joey beat all the favorites in the special Jubilee race aboard a privately entered Yamaha TZ750. Another huge achievement that year was Dick Greasley and Mike Skeels becoming the first pairing in the- Bro, I gotta check out, I gotta do a reaction video on the sidecar because this look insane. I've seen some clips before while reacting side and, car event. and I'm like, what the hell? Especially the passenger who is literally like laying down on the sidecar is, yeah, nuts. A long-standing class at the TT to break the 100 mile an hour lap record, clocking in at 102.8 miles an hour. The quest for speed really was coming from all angles, regardless of the risks. Getting back to Joey, while he did show his prowess on a motorcycle on the island early, his domination wouldn't start quite yet. In fact, a year later in 1978, it would be an old fan favourite that would return to take the spoils. After an 11 year absence, Mike Howard returned to the island to win the Formula 1 TT, following those winning ways up the next year when he'd take his 14th and final victory in the senior race in 1979, clocking an average speed of 111.75 miles an hour. The following year in 1980, another milestone would be set, and this would mark the start of dominance from one man throughout the 80s. In the classic TT of that year, Joey Dunlop recorded the first lap over 150 miles an hour on his way to winning the race by 21 seconds. And this is 1980. We're in 2024. Oh my God. His second of many, many wins to come. Through the 80s, Joey would amass 12 victories, taking him second in the all-time winners list by 1988 with 13 wins, behind Mike Howard on 14. But as you've probably guessed, there was still much more to come. 1989 saw more records being broken, with the first 120 mile an hour plus lap being recorded, but not by Joey. Without world championship status, the Isle of Man TT and road racing in general was beginning to look more like a specialist discipline. But it would be the future two-time British superbike champion Steve Hislop that would be the first to break the 120 mile an hour barrier, Damn. clocking 121.34 miles an hour on his way to winning the senior TT. And in fact, it was another superbike legend in four-time world superbike champion Cole Fogarty, who along with his lop would provide some epic races over the following few years, culminating in the 1992 Senior TT, when the pair both broke the lap record in a titanic battle, his lop eventually winning by just four seconds. It was Fogarty who would set the new benchmark for speed, however, setting a lap record pace of 123.61 miles an hour on board his Yamaha FZR 750R. Superbike technology was coming on at a fast rate now. Even though the top speeds of around 170 miles an hour weren't that far away from what Bob McIntyre's Jalera could do back in 1957, with decades of advancement in tyre, chassis, engine, and rider capabilities, they were considerably faster everywhere else around the track, mm. meaning risks were greater, as were the outcomes of getting it wrong. But there was no sign of the show slowing down, even with the number of deaths on the island up to 165. Bro, now, oh it's got to be God. said that over the previous decades and decades to come... I wonder if that also include like the numbers of drivers per year. Does it include, does it increase or is it the same amount of drivers per year? That, that do also play a difference. Um, the Manx authorities worked very hard in a number of ways to reduce the risks where they could, even down to completely changing sections of track or removing buildings that were deemed too hazardous. But outside of moving the race to a dedicated racetrack, the risks would always be huge. But at this point, the event was entrenched in motorcycle racing culture. And with the Manx authorities and the riders happy to continue, the show went on. 92 also saw Joey Dunlop getting back to winning ways, picking up a win in the ultra lightweight class to take his tally to 14 victories, equaling Mike Howard's record. 
The rest of the 90s saw Dunlop's stardom go from one of the greatest ever to undisputed King of the Mountain. Through the next decade, Joey picked up 13 more victories, the Damn. final being in the year 2000 at 48 years old. This put him 12 wins ahead of the next best rider, with no one other than Joey being able to pass Hailwood's 14 wins to this point. Many thought it was a record that would never be beaten, but as you'll see later, someone quite close to home had other ideas. The world wondered just how far Joey could go, but tragically, his time atop the mountain came to a devastating end when just no. a few months after the 2000 TT, he lost his life during a road race in Estonia. It was Damn. news that shocked the motorsport world. More than 50,000 people attended his funeral in Ballymoney, Northern Ireland, with many more thousands watching around the world. He was a man loved by many, a hero to many more, and he created an everlasting impact through sport and his well-documented charitable work. And his legacy forged over 20 years is one that will never be forgotten. Moving into the new millennium, it was unclear if there was anyone that would take the mantle and assert themselves as the dominant force at the TT. But with two wins under his belt already, it was John McGuinness who would ultimately be the one to do it. Between 1999 and 2007, McGuinness collected 13 titles and Damn. in the same year achieved another milestone. During the opening Superbike race, 13. McGuinness became the first man to break the 130 mile an hour barrier, clocking 130.35 mile an hour lap speed aboard his Honda Fireblade. It was clear that these 180 brake horsepower machines they were now riding were beasts that needed to be tamed to get them around the circuit in one piece, while at the same time achieving the ultimate goal of progress, and with it, winning. As the years went on, McGuinness kept winning, and over the next eight years claimed 10 more TT victories, taking his total to 23 wins, putting him second for overall wins ahead of Howard's 14, and only three back from Dunlop's 26. As it happened though, with the increased competition from younger riders, McGuinness failed to add to his tally over the coming years, and people once again wondered if anyone could touch Joey's record. Through this period, we saw a number of stars rise to the top. New Zealander Bruce Anstey took 12 wins, Ian Hutchinson took 16, while being the first rider to win all five solo events at the 2010 TT, Damn. as well as the emergence of the next Dunlop in line to tame the island, Joey's nephew, Michael. Coming from the family he did, many wondered just what he could achieve. This is a man that had lost his uncle Joey when he was young, as well as his father in his early TT career. Would he still continue down the same path to make a name for himself? Yes, and it didn't take long. In his third visit to the island in 2009, Michael bagged his first win in the Supersport class. Let's he had go. two more wins over the next three years, but it was in 2013 that Michael Dunlop very much arrived, taking four of the five wins available. The new force at the Isle of Man TT was here and it was another Dunlop. Characterized as a man willing to attack and take the biggest risks, Michael kept winning and breaking records, taking at least one win in all but one year he turned up at the island. Even after heart- Like how do you, like how do you become a driver, like a rider? Like how do you have to get like sponsored by like big companies and whatnot? Like, you're not taking like your personal motorcycle and just entering the race. Like how do you go about like being like, I guess selected for these companies to like sponsor you for this race? like. I wonder how the process is that goes. Breakingly losing his brother during a road race in 2018, Michael kept his head down and kept winning to cement the Dunlop name as the greatest ever in road racing history. One astounding record is that he became the first rider to break the 130 mile an hour lap record on a 600cc super sport bike. From 2013 to 2024, Michael won a staggering 26 races, and Damn. together with his three early wins, surpassed his uncle's tally, taking the all-time record to 29 victories, along with the crown of King of the Mountain from his legendary uncle. Is the this goal? a record that could ever be beat? It's tough to know. That being said, if it's going to be anyone, it's going to be the most recent star to shine on the island, Peter Hickman. Hickman has amassed an incredible- Yeah, he- like let's say Hick Hickman, yeah, that's one name that sounds familiar from my previous like TT Man um reactions, but yeah, his name keep coming up all the time. Fourteen victories from his last five TT appearances, already matching Mike Hellwood's impressive record. Peter is also the current lap record holder, setting an average speed of 136.36 miles Damn. an hour set in twenty twenty three where he was also the first man to break the 200 mile an hour barrier down the Solby Strait, clocking a reported 202 mile an hour. And when you hear those kind of numbers and consider they're all taking place on public roads, it's got to make you wonder, did the ancestors of this iconic event have any idea what this was going to lead? 
day two. And they had no idea, especially technology that we had now. I'm pretty sure they had no idea. 200 miles an hour, a motorcycle, no doors, no roof, no nothing, no airbags. Bro, that's insane to even think about going that fast. And if they did, do you think they and still would have gone ahead with it? 269 riders have lost their lives to racing on the island since its inception. Damn. For many, that's enough for them to feel it has to stop. But if the island and its authorities are happy to host it, the riders are willing to compete, and the officials and volunteers are willing to help, who are we to say any different? For me, in a world exactly. that's increasingly risk averse, the riders of the Isle of Man TT are the closest we're going to get to modern day gladiators. And I hope that it stays for another hundred years so that many more fans and casuals alike can experience the incredible feeling of watching this ultimate test of skill and bravery. Thanks so much. It's insane how fast these motorcycles be going. But anyway, that's it for this reaction. I hope you guys enjoy. If you had anything to add, let me know in the comments. Also, like, subscribe, join the fam, and I'll see you for the next one.